So, uh, if you would state your name and the location we're at for this interview. <laughs> we, Louise Glick. If the Glick is spelled with a U and an umlaut, and the name is Hungarian. And we're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in my apartment. Okay. Um, and, of course, I know the answers to many of these questions, but... Uh, so, what genres do you work in? <laughs> Poetry, and I, I have written some essays, some forewords to books when I was judging first book prize contests, but in the main poetry. Yeah. Are you going to collect those essays? Yeah. Good. Good. Those are oh, so excellent. Because I... You worked really hard at them, I, I know. Worked, I worked so hard, and they ruined 10 summers, because they made me... <laughs> frantic with anxiety, the idea of trying to do, to serve a new talent and to describe its uniqueness. Right, um, right. And, you know, it's a natural offshoot of teaching, which I've loved for years. And I, I loved everything about judging those contests. And I loved working with the poets on their manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And in the early days before Yale press was convinced that this was worthwhile, I used to buy a plane ticket for people so they could come here and spend three days working. Oh, okay. And then we would, you know, I would make very detailed recommendations, which they were free to not take because the book had yeah. won. On the other hand, they weren't free to change the books any which way. Um, yeah. Because I could say this is not the book I chose, so they had, they they could stay exactly as we were, or they could respond to suggestions and mm -hmm. uh, and work further. And many of them actually felt a great need for that kind of work, and they just didn't have somebody who was willing to take that kind of detailed yeah. daily interest. Well, I, I mean, from what I'm experiencing, it doesn't seem to be a, a very common thing for Is, I, the selector to, to make a, a real interest think, after they choose and then they're done and they get their money and they're on their way. I but. think that's sort of how most of them feel and yeah. most of them also don't want... Is this off the point that you're... No, 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 no. Okay. It's, all, it's all of one thing. Uh, most of them don't want to read a lot of books. Or some, some in some contests, they're not permitted to. Yeah. They're sent 10 finalists. Right. Screened by... Who knows? It varies. Yeah. Um, but if these manuscripts are being screened by people <coughs> whose um, aesthetic judgment you question... You don't know what you're getting. Exactly. So I, I asked to see as many as possible and um, with the understanding that nothing would be thrown out until a winner was chosen because if I didn't find a winner in 100 manuscripts, I was going to see the next 100. Right. And that was all, that was all fun because you didn't have to read each book through to completion and you didn't have to write a little paragraph evaluating it the way you do for... Okay. Other kinds of things. Yeah. If you if you didn't love it, it was unlikely you would choose it. You yeah. Put it in the unlikely pile. Right. And my living room was filled with piles, <laughs> you know, identifiable by me. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, I would read through the piles to see whether something got promo promoted or demoted. And mm -hmm. some years were thrilling. I mean, there was too much stuff. And in those years, most of the runners-up ended up winning. Some other... Well, later Yale prizes. Oh, okay. Because I would... You would encourage them to resubmit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Some people would submit like three and four times. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I don't... I want to know who it is. But we'll... well, we'll do that when yeah. that's all. Okay. Um, the, uh, so what, part, what time of year were you usually doing that evaluation? It, it worked out... Very well, because for a lot of that time, I was just working half-time mm -hmm. at, at Yale, not in the spring semester, and I would get the manuscripts in December right after the semester ended. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there was a little bit of... I, I, I tried to give myself a couple of weeks of blank. Yeah. Um, and then the cartons would start to come 
from the people who were screening. And Yale allowed um, the appropriation of a, of a mechanism that I had picked up from Michael Collier when I judged the Bakeless Prize that he mm -hmm. supervised. Um, he had each poet who was judging choose younger poets to screen. So I chose ten poets, and they got paid a pittance. Oh, that's nice. And each of them read a hundred books and sent me ten. Okay. And kept ninety. Yeah. And that meant that I had someone to talk to about each of these manuscripts. Yeah. And sometimes we would talk before they even sent things, and they would say... And read me a few poems and say, well, "Do you want to see this?" Yeah, I'm I'm on the fence. Yeah, and um, I had great people screening for me, mm -hmm. and they were people whose judgments I trusted and who sent me very uh, broadly diverse manuscripts. And one thing that I wanted was a series in which the books weren't all alike. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. Anyway, so no, they're definitely not. that was great, and then it, but it meant that all the prose writing I did for ten years was writing forwards, mm -hmm. and I have, so I have a stack, and yeah. I, I've, and a few other essays. It doesn't make as pleasing a collection as it's the first one. Yeah, uh, but. I can't stand the idea that it's just going to go nowhere. No, I, I'll, I will be very excited to have that book. Oh, well, good. Do um, you have an idea of it for a title? Not three words. Not three words? That's Not like proofs and theories. Oh. This and that. Oh, okay. Not, 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 the, not a clone. Um, no. I, I don't either. I want it. If I think of something. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. I really need it. Okay. I, I'll, I'll acknowledge you. Uh, is it coming out of FSG or is it? Yeah, but not in any. Not for, in a, in a while. Yeah, I mean, when I. You've got this next book. And, yeah. Okay. Um, well, that was the first question. Yeah, I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. started as did. What was that about? Well, it wasn't about digital. Anyway. No, it was just, it was just the yeah. general. Usually it's one word. Um, but uh, I guess the other. I saw. I went to AWP this year, which was. I've, I've never been. Yeah, you should never go. Um, it's sort of where I think. But uh, there was a there was a panel with uh, Richard Sykin. Oh right. And who were the other two? Uh, Arda Collins. Was Arda Collins there? and um, I'm losing it. Fatty Judah. And, yes, exactly. And they were talking. I just I caught the second half, but I, so I heard uh, Sykin talking about who's who's working with you on Crush, which was really funny. Um, He's funny. I didn't know how funny he was. I didn't, oh, you yeah. know, I mean, like, the book is pretty intense, but... Great. He's a great visual artist. Okay. Oh, yeah? Oh. Oh, does he really? <laughs> I like that. I think he's amazing. Yeah. That's he made these envelopes because he thought he was going to be living in Europe. Uh huh. That's how he made. Hmm. <laughs> that one's wonderful. All of these things. I like that. One. And then he, the, you know, the message was the envelope. <laughs> I just, think, I, I don't, I don't know how you can frame them because. Yeah, I don't, I don't like know. They're, they're very nice. Aren't they wonderful? Yeah. Um, and he has another book coming out too, right? Yeah, he does. Um, which I saw a long time ago. I mean, the other, Peter, Peter Streckfuss has a new book. Oh, that's And, um, oh, it's wonderful. Is it? I, I really love his first book. I, I love that book. Yeah. I love yeah. that book. Um, and I, I just think he's an amazement. Mm -hmm. um, and Jay Hopler has a new book that he's peddling. Oh, so uh, those first three, I worked with really. Those are all really strong books. Closely on the first books, and 
with Peter and Jay, I worked a lot on the second two. Um, with Richard, much less. I mm -hmm. mean, he... It's funny, because he needed a lot of editing. His poems were way too long. Yeah. The stanzas were too long, the lines were too long, but you had to preserve that sense of... Um, an avalanche sense, that uh, headlong sense. And so it was very hard to figure out. But once he, once he saw a way, a way of approaching the language to edit it and still give it, mm -hmm. still preserve its character, he was he was an excellent editor, and he may feel that he just knows how to do it. Yeah. On his own. Yeah. Well. I mean, we talk on the phone, and yeah. But um, I haven't, and I saw early versions of a lot of poems. Yeah, well, um, and Crush has become sort of the, its own cult little book. Phenom yeah, it really has. Yeah, um, I know. and it's been it's it's interesting. I mean, I remember I first heard about it um, at Breadloaf that year. I was there, and somebody oh. was like, "Have you read Crush?" And I was like, "No, like I'm sorry." And then they're yeah. like, "Must." And then I taught it, and then I still have you know I, we we know the MFA students kind of at Idaho and. There's still some of them are teaching it, and, or or like the guy I one of my the guy who's actually working for me in digital is ba based his final poem and his thesis off those lines and those and that sort of stanza style. So, well, a lot of people sound like him. You can see they read the book and then they, they, they can't it. get out yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah that, that's the that's danger. Hard. Yeah, I know. Um, but uh, yeah, um, are you? So you're. Can I just stay? Sure. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome to stay. I'll just stay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you can tell me how ridiculous this interview is later. Uh, so your primary you genre... Show me talking about me, <laughs> No, no, no. Show me talking my about question. you. <laughs> um, and so your primary genre is poetry, correct? Yes. <laughs> uh, so what kinds of devices do you own or is have access to? also, or just you? Um, <laughs> what, what, what kinds of devices do you have access to or, or use for writing? I have access to an iPad. I've never written anything on it except a, a terse email. Okay. Um, and I cannot bear reading poems in that form. Mm. And in fact, today there was a conversation with my publisher because they finally figured out a way to their satisfaction to convert their poetry listings to ebooks mm -hmm. and question was did I, would I give my permission and I cannot bear reading poems in that form mm. scrolling down a page you have no idea how long the thing is yeah you don't know whether you're in the middle or the end and um, Miranda who is my you know daily editor not my big guy editor, oh, okay who was a student of mine at Yale. Oh. It's very funny. I have all these students now in positions of, of well, I, I hesitate to say authority, but I turn to them for um, yeah. solace and advice all the time. And it's, <laughs> so, um, Miranda is quite great, and her mm -hmm. judgment is wonderful. And she was a wonderful beginning writer, too. Um... Anyway, she she said she thought it was a good idea. She said, for people who are used to reading in this form, yeah. it's not such a violation. Mm -hmm. But it makes me uneasy. So, so if friends, for example, when I was in Stanford and friends would send me drafts of poems, as we do, yeah. I do through the mail. Right. Um, or... At Stanford, I would give something to a secretary, but you know there wasn't a lot. Lot well, that's I'm further up the pike. Um, I just have to go to someone who can print it. You out have to have and, it on paper. Yeah, and that's well. I have to be able to move my pen around and make notes first of all. Yeah, and I have to see what it looks like, um, what is what the duration is, what. And I have to be able to read the beginning and the end. I have to have them all in my head, but mainly it's that I don't know how to make notes otherwise. 
So I have, but I have this that gives me fantastic pleasure in other ways. Mm-hmm. I love it, and um, it's a an endless amusement. Um, and I keep it very near my bed or on my bed. And if I wake in the middle of the night, I turn on the light and I see if anybody's written to me. <laughs> and I always loved getting mail, and now yeah. and now I have that experience around the clock. Right. Except that I, you know, I I I check it every four minutes, and I'm so mm-hmm. heartbroken when there's no change. You know, it's just the <laughs> same old email yes. from Amazon or you know like mm-hmm. some some website that I patronized once. Right. Um, and I have a regular old-fashioned cell phone. I only got a cell phone about five years ago because I'm taxi dependent and mm-hmm. I needed to be on the street and call Calling. the guy. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't do, it doesn't receive emails or so you, anything so like you just, that. And it's a regular iPad, just like a the first, no, or a larger not. one or a smaller one? The iPad that I have? Yeah. I'll show you it. It's because how it looks is part of its story. Okay. You might want to take a picture of it. Okay. I'm going to take a picture of that from the bedroom so let me know if you want to size that. Oh, the stream? Yeah. Yeah. That, that little one. Yeah. Please. I'll do it when we're done. Okay. I don't know what size this is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's the regular size. They have the minis now. That's the only kind of difference. What size. happened was, <laughs> I went to. Some of this has to be off the record. Okay. This um, event, I was invited to this thing, the Golden Plate Award for, sponsored by, held by, something called the Academy of Achievement. I mean, it sounds so spurious and ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, but but to sh- you showed up and you got ten thousand dollars and it was in oh. Washington D.C. and you, the hotel was enormously swank. Nice. I mean, super swank. So I I asked my agent to find out what was the fewest number of days I could go and still collect the fee, and it was one. <laughs> So I scaled it way back, and yeah. I found out when I arrived that the dinner the night before for the honorees um, had been in the chambers of the Supreme Court with the justices. Oh. <laughs> just, just, that, just the justices and the honorees. Yeah. I could have... You could have eaten... I could have eaten dinner and... Oh, no. <laughs> so... Anyway, when I arrived, part of my welcome package was this thing, and it was all programmed with the winners oh, okay. and their bios. Um, yeah. And, oh, the entertainment, the, the last night when we all got our plates. <laughs> you actually got gold plates. Yeah. I mean, the room was, it was a, a very, very good for a banquet meal. It was yeah. extraordinary. And in a space, I mean, if you squared off this room, mm-hmm. these all, the whole thing, it certainly wasn't bigger. Yeah. It might have been a little smaller. Uh-huh. So picture an intimate space. I always want people to guess, but it's ridiculous. What are they going to guess? Mm-hmm. It was like seeing Mozart. It was Aretha Franklin. Oh my gosh. Really? Aretha. Yeah. She was there. <laughs> right wow. where the tulips are. Wow. Yeah. Different color. <laughs> um, so the, the whole thing was eerie. Anyway, the guy gave, gave me this when I arrived. I said, don't give me this. I'm never going to use it. Give right. it to someone who can make use of it. Right. He said, I have to give it to, to you. And I said, but I, I won't use it. I don't want it. I'll leave it in the hotel room. Please give it to someone else. Mm-hmm. And he said, I have to give it to you. And he thrust it at me, and then I was holding it, and then I seemed to have it. So I took it to the hotel room, and I'd seen how people 
push the screen, so I pushed the screen. Yeah. Nothing happened. I mean, it wasn't connected <laughs> to anything, but, and I thought, well, I apparently don't have the gift. <laughs> and um, so I, I then brought it home. Um, well, actually, I had somebody ship it to me. Uh huh. And then I kept looking at it and thinking, I guess now that I own this, I should learn how to use it. But I, I lingered in that state for about six months. And then um, at some point, I asked one of my, I, I have former students from Williams and Yale I'm yeah. still in touch with, and the Yale students sometimes come up here to work on their stuff. Mm -hmm. And one did, and I said, what do I have to do to learn how to use this? Yeah. And he said, well, you need to get Wi-Fi. And I said, how do I do that? Do I call AT&T? Do I call Comcast? He said, call Comcast. So I called Comcast, and they asked me questions I couldn't answer. Yeah. Do you have a blank? Do you blank blank? And I said, I know nothing. You have to just assume I have nothing. Yeah. But he, I, I thought this is not going to work. It, it wasn't working. So I called the student back, and I said, write me a script. Here's the kinds of things I was asked. Yeah. Tell me what I say. Right. So we, I went back and I recited my script, and someone came to the house and installed a, a device. Mm -hmm. And no one had told me that it had these little strobe flickers, and I'm epileptic. Right. So I thought, oh, this is never going to do. Yeah. So I uh, called a, a student again. And he said, you can turn it around, just turn it so the strobe is facing another direction. Yeah. And I did. And, but then I still didn't have an email account, so then someone else came up to work on poems and I got an email. Then I was so horrified at this transformation <laughs> that I didn't do anything further for another six months. <laughs> And then Robert Pinsky, I told him I had an email, and he sent me a photo of one of his grandchildren. Uh -huh. And I opened this little thing, and there was a photo. Yeah. And I thought, wow. Uh, so I, I learned certain skills. I still can't add an attachment. Uh huh. No, that's not what they're called. An, an app. I don't oh, know how to okay. Add them. Yeah. So somebody has to do that when I need want. an app. Yeah. Yeah, like I wanted a HBO because I couldn't. The get HBO the go one. Yeah. But then I have all of these, you know, names, passwords, and I can yeah. never remember what they are. Then they ask me, you know, you say you want to change your password. Yes. And they ask me my special secret question, which makes absolutely no sense. What is your favorite pet's name? And I didn't have pets. <laughs> I mean, except when I was a child. So I have no... Yeah, I, no. I can't. And they say, well, we can't change the question because the, the person who this is came up with this question. And I, I think I, but I, I never would have. Right. Right. I still haven't figured that out, but now I try to write down the, the, new, put the password, password somewhere under, so you have some other place to get it from. In my phone book. Oh. Because, because uh, they, there's such a long list in my head, and I don't know which one is for which. Right, right. So all that stuff I hate. Yeah, no, it's 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 a uh, it's such a daily part of life now, and we just we all dislike it. And, when it's new to someone, it's also well, you kind of realize how awful some of it is. I, um, I like the adventure of the male, and I like watching. I've, I've watched a lot of television, and when when I was I had bronchitis this winter, and it was wonderful because mm -hmm. there it was in bed with me. I didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah, I didn't have to sit in a chair. 
you had it all right there. Endless. And you had endless stuff too, right? Yeah. Do you have Netflix or everything? Oh, you have. Oh, okay, you're set. You're yeah. Set. Yeah. Um, and I have some. I have another thing. I have. I own something. I own Breaking Bad. Mm. You bought that. Because I didn't want to wait for the last, the last season. season. Yeah, it's worth it. That was a pretty intense season. Yeah. Um, Once Gus died, this, the real spine went out of the show, <laughs> in my view. Yes. But I loved it. I loved that show. I did, too. Yeah, we just finished that one. Oh, not yeah? Too, not too long ago, yeah. yeah. What else have you liked? TV-wise? Um, what, are, what are we watching now? The American. The Americans is very good. Is it good? Yeah, that's a very good one. Have you seen Friday Night Lights? I've watched some of Friday Night Lights, but she, you've never seen it, right? No. So whole, we we need to, to do the whole thing. From the beginning. Yeah, I did it several years ago. Yeah, I I love that. So I watched that at Stanford this year, and I thought it was going to take me there are five seasons. I thought this is going to last me the whole of my Stanford experience. It's going to be great. Mm-hmm. And I had I finished in about two weeks, <laughs> but then I didn't want to watch anything else. It's yeah. like when you read a really marvelous book, and there was something about. I mean, I can record and watch things on demand, but. Yeah, there was something about the fact that I could do this anywhere, mm-hmm. and if I went to a hotel, I could do it. Still have it? You still do what you want? Yeah. Oh, it was just, I, it was, it was an amazing discovery for me, and I loved that show. And I ended up watching the last season a second time, and then I still didn't want to watch anything else, so I watched the first season, <laughs> and I was ready. Um, but I have not, I have not found a new thing. Since then? Since then. Well, it's been have you, a month. you you watched The Wire? Okay. I watched The Wire on TV at Frank's house. Ah, uh, yeah, that would be a nice... Because he has equipment. Uh-huh. He has yeah. lab-quality equipment. Um, well, I'll think of some, some other ones for okay. sure. Um but yeah, we should talk about. <laughs> yeah, if you think of other, all right, yeah. I'll definitely. Oh no, I'll let you know because yeah, I mean, we watch a lot of okay, TV I, and I we like the series. A title for my book and and title for your book and okay, all right, all right. Moving along. Moving along. Um, so far, this is a thud of an interview, isn't it? We haven't we haven't had any technical <laughs> discussion. No, it's good though. It's all whatever. Right. I mean, like you know, it's it's about being a person. Um, yeah. So uh, you you kind of. It's kind of I gotta kind of adjust on the fly here, but I think I'll just skip these because you don't really you don't you don't write any poems on the iPad. You never have them in digital format until they go to your publisher essentially, and then they'll how do, do you know how they I do it? I send them a typescript. You send them a typescript, and then which they which is kind of harrowing because then I have to prove the digital and be sure there haven't been mistakes, and yeah. there are always huge mistakes. Mm. I could pay somebody to do it, but it would still be the same problem same, having yeah. to proof it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, um, I, I imagine that I'm stuck with that for life because I cannot imagine typing poems on that. So when you, s- you send it to FSG and then someone types, like, or do they scan it and then, I mean, do you know how they do it? No. Okay. Because, I mean, there I, are I ways can, they should be able to. I can tell you who would know if you want to ask. Yeah. Um, do you want? An, mm, maybe. I don't know. Right. Um I'm just, in, I mean, it's just sort of, in, and then, but then once they do that, then they send it back to you and you make sure that everything's right. And then, I mean, you go back and forth with them with the yeah. proofs for quite a bit, right? I mean, right. I remember when I was a student, I think you had, would it have been Vita Nova you were working on or? I don't know. Or Seven so, Ages and you were telling me how you were reading it backwards and I was thinking oh, yeah. how, how much I still that must have that. been. You it's do. It's horrible. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and you need someone to help you. Right. Because you can't, you, it's in your, and you, you hear it pretty, you know. You you remember your your poems are fairly memorized almost all of them you'd Lots say. Lots of them. So like once and especially when you're working in the book like when you're going back through you're hearing it. You he, you your eye makes substitution so unless you unless you read it out of order yeah i.e. backwards you're going to be doing that yeah yeah so. um okay well so. That was the first section, but there's not much to it because of, it's mostly digital. But then this is more practice. Uh, and so I've kind of delineated the writing process into kind of a three-step sort of thing. So there's the composition, there's the uh, 
there's the revision and then there's the sort of organizational archival point. And that's just my kind of construction for this interview. If that doesn't make sense to you, we can talk about it in different ways. It's fine. But, um, so, uh, and I have, I have kind of like the beginning questions, which is kind of to give us an arc, like an idea about the arc of your career. But, uh, and this question I'm sure you'll love, but how long have you been writing professionally, would you say? Well, I was trying to write professionally. I've been writing since I was a child, and I had a very high opinion of my early work, so I was sending books out to publishers in my early teens. Oh, really? Well, they were uniformly rejected. <laughs> um, but I, I did have... Um, I did have that intense dream. Um, and... I developed it as as anybody has to a very tough skin. I mean, I I had enormous vanity. Mm-hmm. So every time one was rejected, it didn't matter that I was fifteen years old. I thought I'm never going to write better than this. This is this is the climax of my vision, <laughs> and uh, no one wants it. Yeah. that was hard. But um, I continued to send things out and when I had uh, when I started working on what became my first book I was in my late teens and from the time I was I think 23 till I was it was published I think when I was 25 something like that um, I had I think 28 rejections okay a real lot but I had some poems in magazines mm-hmm. But it was, all of that was in place by the time I was probably 12. That sort of ambition and and drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then there were long periods of not writing at all that were harrowing, continued to be harrowing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had different mechanisms for trying to get through them. The greatest discovery was teaching because I I finally learned after the first really lengthy this is completely off the track of what you want. No, it's absolutely no no my next question is describe the arc of your career. So this is pretty much well the first time that that happened I went I firstborn had been published and I had not only did I have I, I I pretty much done what I what was in me to do. Mm-hmm. I had also formed um, evolved a style in which there were no complete sentences. There were just little f- bullet like fragments. And every time I thought to write, I couldn't I could no longer. I can't make the sentence, so it's going to be grammatical. But I could no longer; it was it struck me write a sentence. So I, I realized that there was something about that that particular um, wall that I had hit mm-hmm. that that had to do with um, syntax. And I thought I have I have to write poems like Milton's sonnet on his blindness that are all one sentence or as close to that as I can manage. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do anything that approached it. And I couldn't at the same time write fragments anymore. And the more I couldn't write, the more I repudiated the world. I thought that the problem was that I was too worldly, too involved in the world, too diverse in my interests, so I became more and more um, hermetic Mm -hmm. and dedicated, and I would sit at this, I was living in Provincetown for part of this time in New York City, and I would sit in Provincetown at a very beautiful desk that was made for me by my photographer boyfriend with all of these um, marvelous objects to gaze at and it was just horrifying and 
you know, on a good day, I would write an article, the, <laughs> you know, and on a really good day, there would be a noun, mm -hmm. tree, but, you know, we never moved, be I couldn't get beyond that, and I thought, I'm not, I have not consecrated myself sufficiently, there needs to be more forswearing, and I find, I had, I had a, bed of nails kind of life, just sitting in the sort of soup of my failure for a year. Um, and during that time I had one or two teaching job offers. In those years it was very much easier because you, the economy was different and you know, yeah. there weren't all these MFA programs, and especially if you were female. I had a book out, um, and I don't know that I would have gotten a tenure track job given my spotty education, but I, I could certainly. I had these offers, mm -hmm. and I kept saying no, 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 because poets shouldn't teach. I mean, there was a long, long list of things poets shouldn't do. Yeah, um, they should never have children. They shouldn't teach. They they sh shouldn't go out in the world. Um, they can eat, um, but finally I, w I was invited to do a colloquium in Vermont, and I hated Provincetown, but I, I didn't, I didn't know how, I didn't want to just begin moving in a sort of pin the tail on the map kind of way. I, I was making my living as a secretary, I could have done that anywhere, um, in that period. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought I'm, I'll just stay here until the future presents itself. So I went to do this colloquium partly because John Berryman was there and he was a hero of mine and I wanted to be able to pay tribute to him. I wanted to say you are a great artist mm -hmm. and I salute you which I did get to say, but he thought I was just, you know, a chick on the make. It was really, I didn't know how to say to him, you don't understand, I've never said these words. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, I realized about the minute I got to Vermont, I thought I'm supposed to live here. I just instantly loved the place. And it was a four-day thing, and there were all these, you know, English teachers at Goddard College, hippie institution with a naked dorm, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. And they said, you should come here and teach. And I thought, why not? I'm not a poet. I have to face this disastrous fact mm -hmm. and make a life. So I said, yes. And of course, they weren't empowered to offer me a job. <laughs> they were just drunken English teachers who right. liked me. Right. But by then I had had a sort of epiphany, and we, I corresponded with two of those people who are my still oldest, dearest friends, uh -huh. um, Ellen Voigt and prose writer Catherine Davis, mm -hmm. and um, by the three days before the semester started, they there was a job cobbled together for me for one semester. And I moved to Vermont and I got a room in a rooming house with a bathroom down the hall. Um, and the minute I started teaching, I started writing again. And I still feel about teaching that it's a kind of, it's the most miraculous thing I ever discovered because I can't always write, and long periods go by and I don't write, but I can always teach and I will always meet people who fascinate me and who are doing things, who have minds that go places my mind has never gone, and I won't find that stuff in books by dead people and contemporaries. Yeah. New sounding stuff, and it changes me and electrifies me and to work on material that's still malleable 
it was this it was the experience of working on my own stuff um, but I didn't feel competitive I didn't feel well that was so strange because I am very competitive by yeah. nature but not with my students and I wanted those poems to be as great as they could be or in my view mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's still that's served me very well and especially once I discovered undergraduates because I could know them for four years and I lo and Williams yeah. was Williams was Nirvana, you know. I yeah. got there and I thought I'd never been around such smart people. Yeah. I was terrified, <laughs> but I also was thrilled. And you know, the, a lot of those years were years when I couldn't do anything, but then some of them were years when I was writing a blue streak and teaching and mm -hmm. it was never, oh, I teach one semester and then I write, or I teach and I write in between classes. No, yeah. I mean if I was writing I would write when I taught. And in, and in fact, after the experience in Provincetown at the Sacred Desk, I, I have a horror um, of the the special place. Yeah. The, you know, secluded cabin, the writer's retreat. I just can't bear them. I, I want to be, and I want to be without tools. I often have no pencil and no paper, so I have to borrow them or, or buy them. But I don't want to presume anything. I just, I, if there's going to be a line coming into my head, that'll be great. Yeah. And when I'm working on something, then it. So, so the shape has always been um, periods in the desert, you know, without language. Yeah. Some, and then uh, work, which was in, after I was 50, there were most of my books written very fast, like in six, eight weeks. And, and what, then, which book did that start with? The Wild Iris. The Wild Iris. And after that, I thought, I can do anything. I can fly planes. And I remember my husband saying, you are going to really hit the wall very soon. Yeah. And he was right. And I, I developed um, neurological symptoms. The whole, I, well, I had, I had not slept the whole of that summer, practically. Mm. And one side of my face started twitching and I had to teach that fall and I remember sitting in class like this so that nobody would see that my face was oh, wow. and the neurologist said I don't think this is anything mm -hmm. it'll probably go away in a couple of months which it did but every so often I think something like that could come back again you know just some some weird I mean it was it's weird to write that fast and you don't have a sense of agency very hard to revise because yeah the, you can't picture you you don't have you don't remember writing it you just were sitting there and then it was mm -hmm. and um the the last two books, Village Life and the new one, were slower, but um, there's, there were they were steady. So especially Village Life, the, the newer one, there were lots of moments when I thought, this is never going to be a book. I don't know how to put this material together. Mm. Um, so I mean, if you think back, I mean, before you hit this sort of stride where you were producing books very quickly, I mean, what what was it like, say, writing House on Marshlands or... or Long. It took, okay. It took many years. Um, I 
I revise poems heavily and constantly. One poem I remember took two years to write for my mother. Mm -hmm. The opening lines, it was better when we were together in one body. I had those lines in my head for a really long time, and at the beginning, um, at the beginning, I felt very grateful because I thought, oh, two, two really beautiful lines. This is going to be a poem, and it's going to, this is exciting. I have at least these lines to cling to. And then time went by, and nothing happened. No other language attached to that little shard. Uh -huh. And so that those, those phrases, that language, became a torment. It was the first thing I would hear in the morning, murmured in my head, and the last thing I would hear at night. But it was it was a chastisement, a torment. You you don't know what I'm for. Right. And I tried to convince myself it was a haiku. You know, I thought, well, maybe it's just a very austere, abbreviated poem. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think that, and nobody I showed it to thought that either. Um, so that took really a, a very, 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 very long time to write and had lots of different approaches and ended up being a kind of collage of pieces of language from different old poems. And during that time you weren't you just were working on the one poem? I was for a long time, yeah. And so there weren't other poems coming in and out of this. It's just and is that tr traditionally how you work or are there just yeah. one poem and then the next poem and then one, and they finish and then Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then sometimes I sometimes there'll be a massive revision, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll what one addition to a, uh, an accumulating manuscript makes it clear how the thing should be ordered um, and then you see you can make a lot of short little changes and the other stuff because of this new thing but um, so some of the books are slower um, some are the earlier books were revised much more the later books less mm -hmm. um those, though they were, there were revisions in all of them, and though most of them proceeded at some point rapidly from, I would say, um, Averno on, there were, there were hiatuses, like Averno was written in two fast periods. And it's one years. October because I mean because that was such a good chapbook and then yeah okay yeah and I had October and I had Prism right and I thought these two book these two poems can't be in the same book I mean they're just complete yeah. opposites huh. and then there were two years when I wrote nothing mm. um, and I keep it I haven't attended to this in recent years but. For many decades, I kept this chart of what I wrote when, and each year would be written at the top of the, no, the, the years were like that, and the months were like that. Mm -hmm. And if I wrote a poem, then I would write its name, and if I wrote nothing, I would write an X. And so I would, when I got depressed, I would take this thing out and I would see all these lines of Xs. And then they would be, at the end, there would be a little gust, and the little gust would be completely different from what had preceded the X's. Yeah. So I began to be, I, I mean, I trust is a little strong, but I just figure this is how I, it goes with yeah. me. And there's a period usually now, after I finish something, of being happy because I don't I don't have to write yeah I feel kind of on vacation and I have a sense of secret pleasure because no one's seen it and no one has anything to say about it mm -hmm. but I love it and um, and it's 
finished. Um, and I, like last year was such a happy year for that reason, because it's not going to be easy. That's a kind of tape. I'll send you a little clip so you can. Yeah. You can just play it back. Sometimes. They made me take my... I had these beautiful antique trunks in the hall with a Celadon vase of um, Pussy Willow. Uh-huh. And they... I remember me, that. Yeah. I still, still foregrounded in my brain. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, um, so... So... All the rest of those poems in Averno were written after this two-year gap. Mm-hmm. And... Very fast, really right. fast, and none of it figured out. I mean, I didn't have Persephone. I didn't have. You didn't have to sort of. I didn't parts have any the of the that rigging. Are, yeah. I've been reading a lot of Henning Mankell, and I was trying to put um, a, a, an image from each of his novels in one of my poems. Oh, okay. Is he is he a mystery writer? Yeah. Okay. Swedish. Swedish. I was I hate travel, but I was. Is this the Near Wolf book? Near a wolf. Near no, Oh, that's no, a different. No, no, okay. That's different. Okay. No, that's Rex Stout. That was from much longer ago. No, um, Mankell is living. Okay. Uh, Swedish, married to one of um, Ingmar Bergman's daughters. Oh. Yeah, um, and I think he's a genius. I love those books. I yeah. think he's a great prose stylist. I would recommend them. S- start with one step behind, though. Don't start at the beginning because the first book is not good and you wouldn't read the rest. Okay. Um, but very dreary, compelling, um, with a, a, it's, there's, there's, his detective plods ahead and he you know he notices small things that don't make sense and turns them over in his mind but he's not a firebrand mm-hmm. and he's not handsome and um and there's a kind of dreary sameness to his days but the book the, the books are fantastic in what they, what they, their notion of what triumph is. Mm-hmm. Triumph is persistence, and then it turns into comprehension. You know, a pattern is revealed. Yeah, it's they're really. I love them. So I, I was reading those, and I think something of his prose style crept into my poems. Mm. Um, I don't know that another person would think that, but in in Averno, or I mean, in Averno, did it transfer through into a village life at all? No, no? It, it, you know that was that was book. it. That was his book. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we start, so so you had your first sort of period of silence uh, after Firstborn, and until you started teaching at Goddard. Um, and then was it was it like that sort of like a, a repetition every time? I mean, if you finished a book, did then you? I mean, you had the, the pleasure, but then you also had the silence, or did some no, someone's jump? No, sometimes it was yeah. Well, yeah. with with Marshland, there were a lot of silences in, in, during you know, the, the, the composition. It took about six, seven years. Okay. Was, I mean, Firstborn was published in nineteen sixty eight, but. It was finished in '66, mm. and House on Marshland was '75, so. and it didn't. I was put in touch with Dan Halpern, who was starting Echo, by Stanley Kunitz. Mm-hmm. Stanley said, "This this young sport loves your work," and I thought, you know, I don't want to have to send this out 28 times. Yeah. And so I thought, I'd just go with someone whose family recommends who loves it. Mm-hmm. So it was published 
pretty soon after it was done. So that was a very, very long yeah. period. But I feel as though uh, Firstborn is just an artifact from another life, and that really my writing life began with The House on Marshland. And I think, you know, I can see how each book came out of its predecessor mm -hmm. uh, after that. What do, you, how, what do you mean by that? Can you see, like, could you point to poems in the previous book that were harbingers of the next? Or you just, or sort of turns of language? I know you also, I mean, you, you speak in your interviews about how you go through and try to kind of eliminate the language of the one book before you move yeah, into the next. Yeah, but even in that sense, so that you, um, certain stylistic takes, you, you try to recognize and prohibit the mm -hmm. way I tried to prohibit fragments. Um, but... They seem like the work of the same person mm -hmm. on some sort of journey. Um, and I try to make them as different as possible. What, and what is the... I mean, I'm, I'm interested in what the work of doing that is. I mean, is it... You've just lived with these poems so often that you recognize immediately what the stylistic ticks are and that they're easy to do? Or is it something that when you read through the book in its finished form, you're like, oh, I see that, and I see that, and these are the things that I need to really work about eliminating. I, I never see it when I'm working on the book. Yeah, which would be probably suffocating. Yeah. yeah. And so it's only afterward I think, well, I can't do that again. Uh, and and then sometimes you see isn't it, things like, isn't it odd? I've never used a contraction, ever. And then you think, well... I guess I have to figure out how to use a contraction. And that becomes a whole... Well, what you realize is that that's quotidian speech. That was what I hadn't used. Uh -huh. And so then, you, uh, to, in order to use contractions and questions, you, the Delphic voice evaporates and the human is introduced in its place. And... That was a hard moment because a lot of people who admired my work admired it for exactly the thing that was now no longer present. And when, when, what, what period was this? Um, Between which Triumph books? of Achilles. Okay. Um, so coming into Triumph of Achilles, that was the that was the one of the, the ticks that you were, or, yeah. or that was that was one of the changes that was being made. Yeah. Writing. Um, um, Huh. And then, so you go trying for the Achilles to um, what's the next one? Ararat. Ararat, and then Meadowlands, and then Wild Iris. No, other way. Wild Iris, Meadowlands. Oh, I've, 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 I was. Inter I've been. It's you know, okay. You're pretty current. I'm pretty close. Uh, I've been reading the collected, and I'm just. It's yeah. so interesting to kind of like move through time as you're moving through. Yeah. Um, what did you feel about that? I mean, about publishing the collected poems. Oh, it it surprised me. Yeah. Because I always thought it was a terrible idea. Well, first of all, it's not the collected. And I didn't think of it as that. But it's 50 years of writing. And, it, yeah. and I was initially appalled and then amazed at its size because I thought it would be about 300 pages long. And then when Miranda said yeah, it was six, initially 688, said no one will buy this <laughs> we have to we have to <laughs> squeeze it it has to get littler yeah. Um, yeah I thought I thought it was a valedictory gesture I thought it was suicidal to do most of my life I, I, I was I was repelled by it in principle the idea of doing it myself was horrifying mm -hmm. and I I had begun to feel I mean I never read my old books. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I have no reason to. Um, but at some point I had to do something from, yeah, from a, a, a bunch of books, or I had to do a reading, and I, and I, I was asked to do, you know, more of a... Do it. Yeah. So I was reading through the books, and I, I, I didn't hate them. I mean, often, once I 
you know, you finish and you're euphoric, and then pretty too, pretty soon you feel a sense of humiliation and shame. You're just you, you, you just don't want to yes. think about what you've just done. Um, so then after that, you don't go back, and you know, then you're trying to prove you can write mm -hmm. by writing something else. Um, or, you know, the book gets horrible reviews and you have this feeling of, I'll show you. You wait. <laughs> I'm going to knock your pants off. <laughs> no, of course, they don't. The, the people's pants don't come off. Yeah. But um, I... I was reading these old books and thinking they, and I liked them, and I was proud that I wrote them. And I remember a couple of years ago, and I sometimes do tarot readings with Dana Levin. Oh. Dana's sister is a professional clairvoyant, and Dana's very good with the cards, and I trust her greatly. And so we were doing one. I, I guess I had done the cards with Dana, but then Dana's sister, Karen, the clairvoyant, was visiting her, so we had a three-way conversation on my birthday, for a birthday present, about the reading. And Karen asked me questions sort of the way a shrink does, you know, leading questions. She said, you know, what is... What have you you've been thinking about? And I said, writing, and... Somehow it came up that I, I was very frightened by this pleasure that I was taking in my old work because I feared it meant I would do no new work. Mm. And Karen said, I think you have to embrace that. I think that's, she didn't use words like path, but you know, that's your, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You have to, you can't pretend that you're not feeling it. You just must follow that feeling and see where it leads. So where it led was to a readiness to see these books all put together, which had been proposed earlier. In fact, I was contractually obliged to do it, but I would never have been pressed. And there was always the problem of the fact that Echo owned most of the books, and Dan Halpern resented for a very long time, possibly still continuing this moment, my switching publishers, um, which I did simply because his interests seemed to be elsewhere. So I I miss the I miss the attention. Mm -hmm. um, and which book was that a move? Did you move? Averno. Averno. And it was a very inflamed parting. And for a long time, he wouldn't relinquish any of the books he owned, so none of that was possible. But it was fine, because I didn't want it. Yeah. And then, somehow or other, that was all negotiated, and I did want it. And I found it invigorating and generally a very pleasant thing and it made me feel I didn't have to I didn't have to do a big square thing anymore I could and anything that I did was gravy and it and I really like this new book it's not like anything else that yeah. I've done it's sort of surreal it's got prose poems in it mm -hmm. um that's going to be a shocker. I think I don't think people are going to like it or understand it. I th I I think of it as very kind of lighthearted, or it kind of uh, with a kind of well, there's a lightness in it, a kind of casual shrugging bravado. I, that I like. It's not beautiful, uh -huh. like, like certain of the yeah. lyric books. Yeah. But um, 
a lot of people think it's terrifying because it, you know a lot of it is about the end of time but it's not written as struggle mm -hmm. and it's not written as capitulation it's written as what do you know um, <laughs> Yeah. And here we are. Yeah, sort of like that. I yeah. mean, it, there's tones in it that are not unlike what you do. Oh. You know, that kind of um, scratching your head thing. <laughs> but but a kind of merry, merry bleakness. Yeah, um, it's always a pleasurable place to be. Yeah, anyway, so... Um, did you find in actually writing those poems that there was a different way like physically you were going after them or anything else I mean was it well the last couple of books I've written a lot of it longhand which is was a great surprise because everything up until Averno was written on a typewriter all Inc the composition including Firstborn no Firstborn was by hand Firstborn was by hand and then everything from Marshland to till Averno yeah. was composed on a typewriter Okay. And it's one of the reasons that my papers are not valuable, because people, you know, there's not, every once in a you know, there'll be pages with little scribbles, but usually I just put in a new piece, so somebody who goes through all of these typewritten drafts, unless they, the person happens to know my work intimately, mm -hmm. it's, wouldn't know that. They don't, you know, it just looks like a lot of typed poems with yeah. no author's hand apparent but um, that wasn't what I don't know why I I started keeping a journal when I had whiplash and I, someone said you should start writing about what, what it feels like because you'll discover that you're not in as much pain as you think you are. Mm. Ha ha. I mean, I certainly was. But I started, so I, I started this notebook um, recording my whiplash symptoms and mm. the agony that they entailed. And so I, it was one of the, I always did it in bed at night reviewing my day. Um, and it, became the most crucial piece of my day that and listening to the telephone weather forecast which became village life I know I figured that out it took a long time but so I would I would I would listen to the weather forecast and then I would redial and listen to it again and there was this wonderful voice that would say um, Good evening, Boston. And you would realize that the same thing was going to happen to everybody. You weren't just selected specially to be rained on. You know? It was going to, everyone was going to have rain. And it was the first time I actually understood that everything was going to, everyone was going to have something. Yeah. And all, I mean, all those times I'd stood in the drug aisles of the supermarket thinking, Louise, they can't have made all these products just for you. It must, there must be a mark. Someone else is buying these things. And then I would think, yeah, they're buying them, but they, they only use half, whereas I need 10. And uh, anyway, so, but the weather it did make that knowledge present. And meanwhile, I was writing my whiplash symptoms. So, and so I would get in a very spacey, place and so I started making notes for poems hmm. and I would so as not to interfere confuse things I, I did the poems in the back of the book moving toward the middle mm -hmm. and the journal of my pain journal from the front and then, <laughs> then, Next I started, then I'd start a new notebook yeah and after the whiplash went away Surprise! There were many other things to complain about in daily life. So this 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 sort of diary of um, grief, complaint, misery, fear, chronic anxiety, occasional nice things reported. 
but mainly it was the the book was sacred to that mm -hmm. and it was a real it was a real source of sweetness in my life I I even when I didn't have a bad day or I didn't have any real pain or I wasn't sick I felt that I owed it to the book to you know say the worst <laughs> so there would always be that yeah and then there would be these notes and so I have a whole bunch of these eerie notebooks and then I I realized that it was working kind of well and I liked once I started working on a poem then I would work on it the way I always had mm -hmm. Only a lot of it was longhand because I look at, and the lines were getting different shaped, mm -hmm. and um, and the advantage of that was I could also do it when I was commuting. Yeah. So I had a car service in those years, and Averno was the first thing I did when I was at Yale, mm -hmm. um, and I remember working on the poems in the car and then um, I would transcribe them into the notebook in the back mm -hmm. and at a certain point each one would have to be there'd be enough material so I had to play it out on the typewriter and see how it looked in type um, and one fact of working on a typewriter that's either an, I don't know whether it's an advantage or not and I imagine for prose it would be my prose writer friends all love the computer yeah. but um, when I get to an impasse or an awkward line I start have to start over so it's a new sheet of paper and you have to do the whole thing again and so problems emerge in the, those retypings like your your fingers will hesitate over something you thought was resolved and you realize it's not resolved you realize you have to do something different mm -hmm. so you had those you were you were kind of making those revisions in in the actual transcription work they yeah. were coming to you yeah just from some sort of almost like a Almost like a like a practiced feel of the, yeah, of the you, rhythms you're, of whatever. Your, your hands wouldn't type it. You yeah. just realized something was wrong. Either the line was wrong in how it was lineated, which would be simple to resolve, mm -hmm. or the whole trajectory of the poem was awry. Yeah. And that was And then you'd have to problem. go back and do more. Yeah. More and would you at that point would you do more work in the notebook before you went back to the typewriter or once you kind it of varies. Took that then I okay. started working on the then what would happen would be I'd have these typewriter sheets and I would start working on so you'd them you start doing your vision but there. in the same time frame mm. okay so you you're know. back and forth yeah and then how do these they canceled the weather report by the way oh because of the omnipresence of that absolutely yeah Want there's something? bathrooms if you I have to go feed the meter Oh, oh, okay. So Great. I'll be um, do you have a visitor pass? If we part, put the car here? Yeah. Sure. That yeah, might be I can easier. Move it closer. And then you could just park right here and then yeah. we can give it back to her. Make sure you're in a legal place. Yeah, as long as it's in the permit parking. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Just put it in the windshield. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that won't work. <laughs> Win a prize? I don't think that the, the word comes this way. <laughs> oh, it's a bill. Oh, sort of the opposite of a prize. But why well, didn't I? I think I wrote this check already, but perhaps not. Okay. Um, were there any other things like the? Uh, like the weather report for any other books? I mean, did that ever happen before? Were there any sort of other... Like, I, I mean, I, I don't even know... It was village life, movies, or, really. But was... no, no other books had, like, something where... Like a ritual to which 
you were responding in some sense. Um, well, Wild Iris was a garden. I mean, yeah. I had been reading garden catalogs for two years. I had two years of writing nothing. Yeah. And I, I, all I had read was garden catalogs. And plus I'd seen, when I first moved to Vermont, a clairvoyant who told me I would write five books. And I'd written five. Ararat was the fifth. Oh. And I thought, that's it. And I thought, it's obvious because there's no beauty in Ararat. It's just... The whole lyric gift is dribbling away. Hmm. And then I, I read garden catalogs and listened to Don Giovanni for two years. And I thought, I'm brain dead. You know, of course I can't write. Yeah. And, um, and then that, all, that came in a, in, a, in a burst, like a fe- yeah. in February or something, I think? No, it was, um, it was summer. Oh, it was summer. Okay. I started walking around the garden, which had been the only thing that I did. Yeah. And um, and things were coming out of the ground, and I thought, I'm going to try and write something about yeah. a flower. So, in terms of, like, so the difference then, I mean, now we kind of have an idea of... Uh, the handwriting to the typewriter and whatnot. I mean, what was it like when you were just typewriting your poems? I mean, would you you'd sit down at your desk or wherever? I mean, the typewriter is a kind of wieldy th- thing, so you'd have to be in one place wherever you were. In well, your... there would always be. It would be episodic. Okay. Um, and it didn't have to be my typewriter. For example, I remember when I was working on. What was it? Seven Ages, Vita Nova. Mm-hmm. I remember writing some of those poems on an airplane. I wrote two on one transcontinental flight. And then I got to Irvine, and oh. I had to borrow a typewriter. <laughs> but that was possible. Yeah. And then I had to work it out on a typewriter. So there were things that were... But I was I, at that particular point, I was really uh, on a roll. I mean, I knew everything was turning into a poem. Yeah. So I felt um, I could be anywhere, and I could write with anything. I could write with, you know, food coloring. Charcoal. um, Yeah. And I could could make, actually, very crude, um, like, PowerPoints, and I would know how to assemble them. Oh, that's fine. So when you're in that sort of stage, where are these... Are they just coming to you? Are they coming from overheard statements? Or is it it's all just there and you're just kind of waiting to release it? I, I It's nothing overheard. It's just yeah. some weird brain corner that suddenly you have access to and it exists. It's like a temporary shelter. It exists for a very short time. And mm. it, it, it's not like you think I could go back there. You just think... yeah. Do you see any patterns now that you've, you've had these experiences happen again and again that that sort of anticipate you're getting to where that brain corner opens up, or is it? It's always no. I am. I'm always mysterious. It's always mysterious. Yeah. And and um, the last two books have been a little slower in what I felt was a a good way because the stamina called for in that other kind of composition is so extreme mm. um, plus you don't get the, the you don't get a very prolonged experience of immersion you know you get a very intense fast hit Yeah. but I really liked um, the feeling that I had it was like writing a novel that I had a pl- in, in village life I had a, this sound to go to that was like a place yeah. and it was um, accessible I could get there it wasn't like a, this special trick pony you know it was yeah. I, um, and it, w- it meant that the composition was a year instead, which still seems pretty fast. Yes, but it's not as fast as six weeks. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. That was Vita Nova. That was the fastest. Six weeks was the fastest. How, and I, how, how long was Wild Iris? Uh, more like nine weeks. Okay. But there were three poems that were written the year before. They just were crap. But once I wrote the Wild Iris, I once I wrote the bulk of that book, I knew where the I, the crappy poems didn't seem so crappy. Okay. And one of them, did you know Elizabeth Langston, David and Meredith's daughter? Mm-mm. You, did you know David and Meredith at all? No. You didn't take a classics class. Well, she's my godchild, and she was at that point very little, and this was the a period in which I was writing nothing and I I said Elizabeth give me the title give me a title or a first line and I thought I, I if Elizabeth asked me to write a poem I'll have to do it yeah and she did and I it, it got used what was it well I red rose on a lowly vine um, it didn't get called that finally, but it, you know it was a yeah. little song like Valentine of a poem. Yeah, but but thin. I mean, if if it if it looks to you like that's your that's your output for two years, <laughs> okay, it's bad. Yeah, but you know, it had a place in that book. Yeah. So that was so in the main Wild Iris was the first book I wrote fast, but it had it had these three weakish poems that became absorbed into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if, if what will happen now. I, I imagine I'll descend into some abyss. Um, Hopefully not. And, you know, there's just a question of, you know, how much more do you get to do? Yeah. But um, I'm still feeling surprisingly happy with my last one, and I know that until I hate it, nothing's going to happen. How long have you been finished with it? It'll be a year in September. So it's still a baby. How do you know? I mean, you, you have a kind of really a final sense of finality for these things and and I guess like I'm interested in how you do you have like just like a physical sensation when that happens or is it your well, brain stops moving in that direction and it's, it's well, off well you can sometimes have that but it isn't finished oh, okay um I mean that's happened to me a number of times and it usually it always means that there's something that isn't written yet mm. um even though you just cannot imagine what it is. I mean, Meadowlands was like that. I just, I thought, I can't write another of these. Um, but it was clear. I, I, I'm good at putting books together, and I can figure out what each body of work seems to need, and mm-hmm. there was no way to put that together. And something was missing, and I, I thought it was probably some more sonorous tone, but it wasn't that. It was Telemachus was missing. Oh, okay. And I wrote those poems in, I think, 10 days. And then you kind of... And then, oh, it was a breeze. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing felt, you know, came yeah. into place. I think that's... I, lo- I love... I really like that book. I've, I've just been... I like that book, too. Yeah. Um, it's very funny. It's very funny. I know. I think it's a... I think it's a screen. <laughs> yeah. But, um... And I like that. I mean, I like, I like tonal variety. Yeah. A lot, and I like it in what I read. Um, but I think sometimes this, you know, the last two books, I drove people crazy with Village Life because I had maybe four hundred different orders, oh. and they were all not right. Oh yeah, that would be that. I could see that book being difficult to put together. I knew how it had. To, I knew where I wanted to start. I knew where I wanted to end. Mm-hmm. But In between. I and I think it was a matter too of 
something ha- needed to be added. How did you learn how to? I mean, did you learn how to put together books like this? I mean, like what was the what was the sort of education your own your education in that sense? Each book you learn from the material, and I think I learned from students too. Okay. I I think that that I'm a very good editor. Yeah. And I of I would course agree. felt if if I had stuff on a page I would have some good instincts about I mean, if there was anything to be gotten out of that material I would find it. Mm-hmm. Um so a sort of sense of being able to put to use the most pathetic, limited um samples of language but if you just give me some words doesn't matter how bad they are I can do something yeah and I felt the same about manuscripts I thought if there's if there's a way to put it together I'll find it mm-hmm. um, my own books and other people's books too I mean in a way I'm uh, I I'm sure I drive some people crazy because I just look at their manuscripts and I say no just leave it all to me <laughs> you're, you're doing this terribly just, and I was that kind of a mother you know I would say don't feed yourself <laughs> really you know, just don't know how to do it you, you sit I'll feed you you know I just, um, and I, I pe- people don't like that and it's also possible that 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 one could be wrong or or that there could be something something I miss mm-hmm. but um, I think it was it was always it was a I think something that you learn when you write very slowly so you don't have a huge outpouring you have a small amount that you have to make go as far as you can Mm -hmm. and so you learn how to move the parts of a poem around you move you learn you learn how to be an editor out of a a sense of lack yeah and from that grows a capacity to organize disparate things into something that has a sense of dramatic shape and is that that sort of a sense of dramatic shape? Is that your intention for most of your collections? I, mean, I want the books to seem like that, but it's not as though when I'm working on them, I know what it is. Yeah, I pretty much don't. When and do you get that sense? When I'm starting to put it together. When you're starting to see them all together, and then you start seeing these weird um, overlaps and resonances and echoes that you hadn't planned yeah I mean proofing this my new book I I see these strangest parallels and language language recurrences that I mean you could say yes you have a limited vocabulary and so of course there's going to be a recurrence of these, these words that you use because yeah. you still remember them but um, it's also that it's like dreams you know hmm. the mind is is somehow the mind is making an organization that is beyond what the what the comprehending or apprehending faculties take in Mm -hmm. initially so um when you're when you're working but when so when you're working just on an individual poem and you're revising it what's what's like the mode there and you're going back are you just deleting are you substituting or is there primary or just whatever you whatever the poem needs you're you're kind of in service to it yeah it's yeah. The, the aim. I mean, nothing's more. Fun. If 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 I can tell myself that a poem can be made with just deleting things, that's 
great. Yeah. That's two for the price of one. You get the deleted lines if they're any good to use somewhere else. Yeah. And you get a po poem. But oftentimes you can't just delete. Um, often, so, sometimes you can take out everything that's weak and transitions that are obvious. But what you then wrecked is the feeling of uh, duration. The poem has become too brisk mm. um, and needs to have a feeling of more languorous unfolding. Uh, so then that's a problem because you don't know whether you're supposed to add in the places where you had material before or were they the wrong places was that part of the problem. But each poem is its own little task. You just, you know, for a long time, it's a, it's a problem you haven't solved. And then it becomes something that you have solved. Yeah. And is it the same thing? I mean, is it the same feeling of finality that you have with the collection that you have with an individual poem I mean that there's is there's nothing more to be done sort of yeah you know? or but also that it gives you pleasure mm. that you like the shape that it makes yeah and you like it better than you thought you ever could yeah so all these poems you just thought were so cumbersome and there was no way that they could be organized that You just didn't see it. Yeah. Um, suddenly, you actually like them again. Um, has that has your mode of revision has that changed at all over the course, or has it been fairly consistent? I, I'm sure it's quite different. Yeah. But I wouldn't really know how to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, the poems are so different that it must be that the approach is different. Right. Um. I mean, now I'm much more like approximation. I like a sense in, in the poem of um, not the sort of honed, perfect bon mot, you know, the, the epigrammatic. Mm -hmm. I want more the kind of, that kind of, the kind of speech. Okay. Um, uh, a sense of casting about for a phrase. I like that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, human sounding, ruminative, uh, rather than exalted. Uh, but, you know, I think of Averno as, the, the, the books always seem to me, I've said this a million times, this is probably in, uh, there already. <laughs> some of the, these books seem vertical and some of them seem horizontal. Mm. And um, usually they alternate, so there'll be uh, a kind of awe to despair book followed by... Uh, panoramic book. But the last two both seem to me kind of spreading, though they're very different yeah. from each other. Um, anyway. Um, How many people are you going to do this with? Ten. Jesus, you'll be out of your mind. I know. It's okay. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Your number seven? Eight? Oh, you've so, done a lot. Yeah, yeah, I've done quite a few. Um, Does everyone sound different? Yes, it's very interesting what people want to talk about, and people who I've done people who know me and who don't know me, and so there's some wariness, and then there's some sometimes there's not, and sometimes people who know me are wary of the questions more, and and this you I mean honestly the questions haven't really been asked, but I mean you've answered them without my asking them, so that's that's been that's good. It's a good sign, I think. Oh, I hope so. Um, well, we could do it again if it. If you no, no, yeah, I don't think. <laughs> I think there's, I think there's plenty. Um, 
The, I, do, I do have like so when you're revising, are you reading them out loud to yourself? This is is this is that something as part of your practice? I know for some of the other writers it has been. I I I keep trying to make this point in poetry readings. I I hear with my eyes. I I mean the experience of reading a poem for me with my eyes mm -hmm. contains an oral experience. Yeah. And when I hear it, I feel angry, and I feel that there's an obstacle between me and the it of the poem. Right. And the obstacle is the reader, who is determining and deploying emphasis, and also the form which is turning a, a kind of uh, web-like experience into a narrative. Uh, everything goes by once. Yeah. And I, I hear, and the argument made is, yes, but then you can't hear it. But I don't hear it when it's read to me. Yeah. And I don't mutter it to myself. I, I hear it in my head, though, and I hum it in my head. Hmm. Um, I mean, I can hear... You can hear like almost like, like musical notes or tones to... I can hear rhythmic structures. Yeah. I remember with Meadowlands, I had this sense of the book. It was the only time I had this. I had a whole... I felt I had the whole book in my head. I just didn't have a single word. Yeah. But what I had was rhythmic alter alternations. I had... Uh, sh shapes that were clustered and dense and more open shapes and it was almost as though there were there was a musical line and I would hear the you know the rising and the falling mm -hmm. and I would hear choral parts and I I felt I I even tried to annotate it in some way so that I could follow it but it was That's like a hum. Yeah. It was like someone was one. I heard somebody say, a thinker of some kind, not a poet, something about the way a child learns speech, lying in its cradle and hearing the shapes of the the, the shapes made by its by the speech that surrounds it. And it doesn't understand words yet, but it understands. And for me, poems have been like that. I mean, I remember reading when I was really, really young, mm -hmm. reading not baby poems, but great poems, yeah. Shakespeare's songs. And I had, I'm sure, no idea what was being talked of. Right. None. But I felt I... I, I, I was getting something out of those poems. I could hear, I could hear, fear no more the heat of the sun. I could hear the grandeur of that. The, 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 the rhythm. I mean, somebody could turn it into an act of scanning the line, but it, it, that, that makes it so kind of, yeah. Plotting. Yeah. But you do. I did hear things. Yeah. That way, but with my eyes. I mean, my eyes make. I turn what I see not into an argument or a, a reasoned thing. Yeah. A lot of that stuff I miss. Um, what is the poem saying? I often don't. I have no idea, but. I know how it sounds. Yeah, that's its own sort of yeah. intelligent communication too, right? I mean, yeah, that's it. No, that's that's really fascinating. Um, well, I, I'm sure there must be a lot of people who write who have this who yeah. feel that they're yeah. No, I think that um, sound comes to them visually. Well, it's like I mean, it's almost synesthesia, right? I mean, it's yeah. a, it's close to that sort of description, but it's not not quite really. No. It's, but it's an interesting correlation. Um, do uh, 
do people I know you you work with with fellow poets on your poems correct I mean you're sending stuff to to your certain readers etc do you work on individual poems at individual times or is it usually in a collection everything I write goes out goes out okay and so how does I, I want someone to look at it yeah preferably right away yeah how who are like those now. people for where they have they been the same people for a long time or they just change, change from they change person to I person? mean it is um Certain periods, certain people. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you'll feel somebody is the, the book. You feel as though these poems, if they're ever going to be understood by anyone, will be understood by X. Yeah. And yes. you're usually right. And then you, you, when when X says this won't do, you trust it because mm -hmm. the person is basically on the side of the work. Yeah. Whereas if you show it to somebody who from the outset says this is just a disaster it's not going to be the book is has to be you know it's too late to unwrite yeah. it it's right. going to get written and you could then suppress it if you wanted but yeah so it's it, it's shifted I mean there's certain people who have been constant for a very long time Kathy Davis mm -hmm. um, she has been stratospherically helpful hmm. um, and and I like working on her novels and I learn oh, a that's... lot from working on prose what do you I mean what have you learned or do you learn you learn moving around much bigger pieces I mean Kathy's books it's not so much a question of that but there have been books where I felt there's too many characters, and such and such. These, these two could be conflated, mm. and um, other times I think I felt things were in the wrong order, or that too much time was spent on a particular thing. Mm -hmm. But with my former husband, who was a quite terrific prose writer, um, it was often a question of really moving around blocks of prose hmm. um, the way you would do in a poem you'd move a line in a poem but in prose you would move a paragraph or two hmm. paragraphs and and I, so I learned um, it's like weight training I, I could <laughs> use I could move bigger masses <laughs> and it, it was very useful I mean yeah. I don't think I would have written Ararat without that and I think if I hadn't written Ararat, I would have, I would have stalled out as a yeah. certain kind of lyric poet. Right. Um, well, uh, I have some questions about why you chose not to write a computer to to use a computer. I don't know how. I'm epileptic, and I I didn't like. I learned. But I didn't like looking at the screen. And, yeah. Uh, the early computers had a lot of. It was said it was not good for epileptics. Okay. And so you just and then it, I didn't like I did I didn't like it. I liked paper. I yeah. liked pages. I liked type. I love typewriters. What do you love about typewriters? It's <laughs> a big question. <laughs> Doesn't everyone love typewriters? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, um, I don't know. I, um, I, Is it a sound thing? Is it a feel no. thing? Is it a... No, and I, I actually, since the period of burning my hand, I, I, I don't type anywhere near as well because I don't have perfect feeling in that finger. Uh -huh. But um, it was a sense of how sort of slovenly handwriting became form. Mm -hmm. I don't get that on the I don't see lines on the screen quite yeah. the same way. And I don't feel as though I'm making the letter when I do well often I'm not. I'm making the wrong letter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know why I like it. But it probably I don't know why I like it. 
but it's been a, it's been such a consistent part of yeah. every book. I guess, yeah. So. Um, we get to skip all these computer questions. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you, I mean, you you correspond with many people. Uh, yeah. How? Has, well, I used to be a much better letter writer. Has that I changed have. quite a bit? Like, I mean, with receiving in, um, your, I mean, you're sending out with the kind of computer rise, or has that? Is it just sort of? Uh, yeah, it has changed a little. Yeah. Um, well, but I long before I had my little red friend, um, I uh, I had stopped writing letters the way. I once did. I mean, mm-hmm. there was a period in my life when even like 10, 12 years ago, I just wrote lots of letters to lots of people and I loved getting letters back and I yeah. loved writing letters. And then that stopped. I don't know why. It stopped. Yeah. Um, but I, it wasn't because of that. What I've noticed with this is I have now a correspondence with my first husband, whom I had we had exchanged we would exchange letters every two years or something, you know, very mm-hmm. formal letters. Yeah. And then there was a period in which he needed someone to confide in who was far away and so we had a a little period of much more intense exchange Mm -hmm. very short and I saw him and met his current wife I saw him for the first time in 38 years last summer and we liked each other and I thought his wife was just great and it's helpful to kind of substitute for a phone call when you don't feel like making a phone call. Yeah. And it gives people a chance that they would have with a letter but not a phone call to respond when they're ready, ready. to yeah. and not have a moment forced upon them in which they have to react. Yeah. So... So I I have very happy thoughts about this. It just has nothing to do with, with writing. Right. Yeah. And then I think, you know, it was a big moment when I switched from longhand to the typewriter. Maybe it would be equally transforming to mm-hmm. switch to a computer, but not an iPad. I yeah. mean, I would need a real need keyboard a... and Yeah. But I can't use a mouse still. Mm. I can't the I, when I see that little thing darting, um, it, it makes me very skittish and upset. Yeah. So. so yeah. It'd have to be maybe a touch screen. Oh, I think we, are we're we, gonna have to. We're I think we're we're ended. So, okay. um, thank you so much, Louise. Uh, have we ended now that we've moved the car? Well, had to move it.